welcome all and thank you for t tuning in to hashtag girls girls get real girls get real we're going to have a panel discussion today on the portrayal of women and girls in the media in television advertising and retailing seems that way too often much too often girls are bombard bombarded by negative messages and those limiting stereotype messages telling them what they should be, who they should be, how they should act and behave. And, and about a, a month ago, Girls Inc. was part of a convening that the White House held on this very subject, the portrayal of girls in the media and in retailing. And we were asked to be there because we are an expert on the issues that girls are facing. And certainly these messages of limitations, often sometimes objectification, even sexualization, are very real issues for girls. At Girls Inc., we're absolutely dedicated to helping girls overcome these negative messages and even, in fact, trying to change those messages that girls are receiving. So um, we're all advocating on behalf of all girls to change change this environment. And we're not only deconstructing these messages, we're helping girls recon reconstitute them and reframe them so that they see themselves, as we say, as strong, smart, and bold. So we are absolutely honored this afternoon to have the Emmy Award winning, our uh, um, amazing celebrity, partner who has been a longtime champion for Girls Inc. and for Girls Everywhere, that would be Sean Robinson. She's going to absolutely host us today and help us have an engaged conversation. And joining Sean uh, also is Becky uh, ba Ballerin. Becky Ballerin is our Senior Program Director for Girls Inc. in Tarrant County, that would be Fort Worth and Arlington, Texas. And joining also is Garcelle Bo Beauvais. Uh, she's an actress and Hollywood Today Live co-host. And we have Stephanie Latham with us, our director, the director of global marketing for Facebook, another wonderful partner in this journey to change messages, help girls reconstitute and reframe those messages so they can grow up in a very affirming environment. So thank you. To everybody who had take the time to join us in this conversation, this girls get real conversation. Sean, please take it away. All right, Judy, thank you so much. And I just adore you. I mean, you have been such a role model to all of the girls of Girls Inc. and all of the women, the older girls like me. And I am just so honored to have been a part of Girls Inc. for the last, I think, like 10 years or so. And it's just amazing what uh, this organization has done for so many countless girls out there and who just want to dream big and make the best of their lives and who are the first in their families to go to college and they get that um, they get that uh, that power and that encouragement from Girls Inc. So uh, thank you so much for letting me be a part of the organization and I am uh, so happy to, to join my esteemed colleagues here as part of this discussion. So um, let me let me start with uh, my good friend Garcelle. Uh, now, Garcelle, I know that you have you know publicly shared your thoughts about girls and women learning to love our bodies, and it's so tough when we're constantly bombarded with these images of what we should look like and how much we should weigh and what size we should wear. Tell us about the pressure that you have felt throughout your career as an actress and model, and you know now a host. Right. Thank you, Sean, and I'm so happy to be a part of this today. Um, for me, I started off as a model, and um, of course, there's always pressure to be thin when you're a model and you're in, you know, New York City, and we're in high fashion, and the sample sizes are so small. Um, sidebar to that, I grew up in a household with women who had all different shapes and sizes, and I actually were I was trying to eat a lot to gain weight so I could have a round behind and a little bit more hips. So I grew up with what was is considered, I guess, the norm. And then I transitioned to being a model 
where everybody's eating carrots and only drinking coffee and trying to stay slim. So it was really sort of a balance of, wait a minute, I grew up knowing one thing and now it's another thing. So I think it was really a hard transition for me um, to sort of, you know, stay my thinnest and be able to fit into those sample sizes. Um, but what I am happy now with, I am so happy with my size. And I don't care if I walk into a store and I try on something and it's a size 10 or versus a size 8. To me, if it fits and I feel good in it, no one sees the label. Who cares what size it is? You know, I, I think it's all about being healthy and, and being happy with what you've got and work what you've got, whether it's hips, whether it's big breasts. I think that's the beauty, and I'm so happy that now a lot of the different companies are starting uh, to do sexier clothing for plus-size models and really showing plus-size models on covers of magazines and people standing out if they've been Photoshopped too thin. So I think we've come a long way, and there's a lot more... Um, a lot more to do. So I'm happy to see the changes. Can you hear me? I myself. I, I had to unmute myself. But yeah, like when you were talking about that, um, Garcelle, that is so important that you know companies are now joining, getting on board, and saying, okay, we're not going to um, make clothes in just one size. Don't, Garcelle, don't you like when I go to the store and I see these XXX smalls, like I'm like, who who is wearing an XXX small? That is ridiculous. But it just feeds, you know, it just feeds into that that I've got to be as small as I possibly can to, uh, you know, to to be a value. Uh, and that's uh, that's certainly very very frustrating. Uh, we have been joined by Maggie Ford Danielson. Maggie, thanks so much. Maggie is um, from Benefit Cosmetics Global. She's the Benefit Cosmetics Global Beauty Authority. So we definitely like that. And um, and Maggie, let me let you join in this conversation. You know, the, the media oftentimes describes beauty in a narrow and very limiting way. As women, as a woman in the cosmetics industry, how do you define beauty? And tell us what Benefit Cosmetics is doing to helping to help women fully accept themselves and young women, young women and girls. Hey Maggie, I don't know if you can hear me, but I think you might have your um, microphone on mute. If you could just hover the cursor over and you could see how to unmute the, um, the conversation. Let's see. While we're giving, Ma let's give Maggie a chance to find that particular, I know it's kind of hard, this is my first time doing a Google chat, so I'm like trying to figure it out myself. Me too. I was like, oh my God, how do you do this? <laughs> <laughs> All right, as soon as Maggie, I'm going to come right back to Maggie, and uh, they can help her just figure out how to mute her, uh, how to unmute her microphone. We have to have, just for everybody listening in, everybody who is on this call has to mute their microphone while the other person is talking, otherwise you hear all this extra noise. So um, we're just going to let give Maggie a chance to do that. But right now, let me go to Stephanie. Uh, you know, Stephanie, everybody's concerned with teens online and the messages that they're creating and receiving while they're online. You know, how do we help our teens safely use technology and social media? Sure. So hi, everyone. First, I just wanted to say thank you, Sean, so much to you for facilitating this conversation and also Judy, um, of course, for organizing all of this. I think the mission of Girls, Inc. is one that is very important and uh, we're very passionate about that, obviously, here at Facebook, but also um, as the mom of a young girl, it's also very relevant to me personally. So excited for all that we're doing and thank you for letting me be a part of the panel today. Um, this is a very hot topic for us, of course, as I'm sure you would imagine, and we have an entire team dedicated specifically to, devoted to women's online safety. Um, I think the best way to think about it for everyone in this forum is that the first thing really begins with a conversation, and that safety as it pertains to technology or the internet is actually the same as the safety conversations you've had with your family and your parents forever. So I, I have a two-year-old. We have lots of conversations on breaking chips into pieces so that we don't choke or holding hands as we cross the street. Um, and I think the technology piece is exactly the same. And 
one of the critical things is really seizing the right moments. So there are critical inflection points when you get your first phone or the first time you have a conversation about wanting to set up a profile on a social media page, uh, when you get your driver's license um, and having the conversation about texting while driving during some of those key inflection points I think make it really relevant. Um, and I think it's important that it's a family conversation. So it's not just one-sided or one way, but it also needs to be role modeled by everyone in the family um, and enforced so that that becomes kind of the norm for how you are interacting with technology. Um, I always talk about the golden rule, right? I mean, I think the golden rule of people is absolutely the same with technology too, right? Treat others how you want to be treated, um, whether you're a parent or you are uh, a teen using social media, really keeping that in mind, knowing if you feel like that's not how you're being treated by someone else, where your support channels are, if you're feeling harassed in any way or uh, anything that you're not comfortable with, and also knowing the permanence of everything that, that you're doing online and knowing that really making smart choices um, is so critical. I always say nothing should go on social media that you're not comfortable with having on the front page of the New York Times um, because even if it's disappearing, it's really not and it's always out there. And I think that also goes back to some of the family conversations and ground rules and um, really setting clear standards for what's appropriate tone, contact, uh, tone and content online. Um, from a resources standpoint, I do just want to, uh, to call out that there is so much more on this and we've devoted a lot of time and energy to that on the Facebook front. So um, facebook.com slash safety has tons more information, thought starters, questions, and really guidelines for um, anyone that wants to go deeper. Thank you so much for those comments. And I could tell you as a reporter here in Hollywood for the last 16 years, whatever you put online, stays online forever okay <laughs> there have been so many times that we have um, that there's been a story about a celebrity that posted something online years ago they had no idea it was going to resurface and at a cr cr you know critical time maybe they're about to start a movie or about to release a CD or something and then also and then all of a sudden something pops up online about them that is unflattering and also, it doesn't always have to be you posting it. You might have sent it to somebody else, and then they might have sent it to somebody else, and then posted it online. You know, um, I, I'm sure all the women here can uh, can you know can back me up on that one. Anytime you put something online, it is definitely going to stay online. Now, I think we have Maggie. Oh, go ahead, Garcelle. You want to jump in there? Well, I was just going to say, look at the uh, the young football player who was supposed to be the, you know, one of the top drafts in the NFL, and somebody put out a video of him smoking a bong that was done years ago, and right. that resurfaced, and now he went from number one to number 13, and he lost like $16 million because it was out there, and, you know, yes, you got to be careful. Right, and it's so interesting that you brought that up, Garcelle, because my good friend is his manager and we were watching the draft that day and she was just going crazy saying <laughs> because of this he has lost so much money and from what I understand it might even have been like a family member who put this online so you gotta be really really careful okay so I think we have uh, let's see Maggie do we have you okay great great I Maggie, think so. can you can you yes, hear me? I, I can hear you. I can hear you. Uh, Maggie, my question to you is that the media oftentimes defines beauty in a narrow and limiting way. As women in the cos as a woman in the cosmetics industry, how do you define beauty and tell us how benefit cosmetics is helping women fully accept themselves? So I think it's a really good question and a good statement. I mean, you know, in the beauty industry, cosmetics in particular, um, it can be tough. It's, you know, there is a lot of um, negativity out there and there's a lot of people who think that um, that you have to be a certain way, you have to look a certain way, you have to wear your makeup a certain way, you might have to have a certain skin tone or you know there's a lot of stuff that what we call um, there's a lot of um, things out there that are supposed to be aspirational but not but not that's not that, that doesn't mean the same thing for every person um, and that's what makes it challenging is you know how to communicate um, 
positivity in a way that's not necessarily aspirational because aspirational isn't always achievable. Um, so what we at Benefit at least try to do is we don't even really uh, talk about a look or a person as the one thing that we're trying to represent. For us at least, you know, our motto is laughter is the best cosmetic. Um, and that to me, I love that. Um, it's just, it's a really all encompassing, just a warm, friendly sort of environment here at Benefit. Um, and we just always try to keep that in mind in everything we do, not only in our products, but also in kind of the messaging that we put out there, whether it's on social media or whether it's, um, you know, something you might see in a store. But it is, it is tough. I mean, I have a two year old girl also. Um, and, you know, I'm just trying to, raise her to feel good about herself no matter what she looks like no matter what makeup she's wearing or not wearing I mean she doesn't wear any right now so <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah and you know I think um, one of the things that's always that's been really important for me um, I grew up in the in the beauty industry um, and it's really about kind of changing that conversation for me it's about saying makeup doesn't have to be something that you wear to cover up your insecurities um, I think makeup can be something that you use to express yourself. It can be an outlet for creativity. It can be something that you want to put on to sort of enhance your best features. Um, you know, you know, just like clothing, you know, if you have a nice, you know, behind, you wear tight fitting clothes, like you feel good about yourself and vice versa. So, you know, that is something that I think we need to embrace what we God given are given. And, you know, you can just explore that with makeup as well. Right. And I think that, as you said, we're not tied to makeup uh, yeah. as defining us. I remember like there, there are times that I post videos um, to my social media, people on my social, social media, you know, pages. And I don't have any makeup on at all. And I know these <laughs> people have seen me on the red carpet, all glammed up. And I say, you know right. what? You know I didn't wake up like that, right? <laughs> I didn't wake up like that. This is kind of how I woke up. And so just being confident enough. There are some people yeah. that I know, some women I don't know, that won't like be seen ever, like in public ever, without yeah. you know, oh, whole face makeup. All the time. I would I, never I hear even want to all the time. I would never even want to be tied to something like that. So, Gar Garcelle, I see, I see you're nodding your head too. <laughs> I am. Too. First of all, there's too much pressure. <laughs> too much. Totally. Pressure. Um, and now that I'm doing, uh, a, you know, a daily talk show, I have makeup on every day. So on the weekends, that's the last thing I want to do. If I have to do something that requires me to wear makeup, most likely I will say no that I'm not going. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. You know, you just think great. I also think it's great to um, not only to just be real, but also give your face time to breathe and just, yeah. you know, sort of just be you, your your true authentic self. Right, right. Okay, Becky, let me bring you in here. I know you've been waiting patiently. You know, right. this work is definitely a priority for Girls Inc. What are some of the messages that girls are receiving? You know, how can we really... Uh, teach girls to advocate for change and embrace what is u unique about them. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Sean. And first of all, I want to really drive home one of the points that you made earlier about, because I know there's girls and girls watching right now, and you said what happens online, what you put online stays online. So I want our girls to really listen to that um, because that that is so true. And I've seen, you know, every panelist right now shaking their head. Um, <laughs> But this work is really a priority for Girls Inc. because they're growing up in a digital age. You know, they're receiving more visual messages than any women before them. Um, and it's estimated that girls have media exposure for eight hours a day. Eight. And so those eight hours they can have, you know, they can have exposure to anything, you know, unrealistic body images. And the ideal body image, really, that girls see on TV is only possessed by 5% of American females. Um, and so that's the messages that they're getting. Um, so they can be negative, you know, they can be detrimental to their self-esteem. And when we see these stats on paper, um, you know, we see the stats on paper, but when a young girl comes to you and she tells you her story, that stat becomes a reality. And, you know, there was something that I read that a girl wrote one time, and she said, throughout my life, I've always been the biggest, the tallest, the heaviest. She would go home, she'd look in the mirror, she could hardly stand to see her reflection, and soon she said she became like fed up with this concept of perfect. 
and she became exhausted by striving to meet the standard of society's Barbie appeal, is what she called it. And she says there's too many young girls going through what she went through, if not worse. She said her self-esteem was so low that she had to be careful not to trip over it. Mm. And so she said when she came to Girls, Inc. and participated in our groups, um, that helped her build confidence in herself to resist the stereotypes and to just love her physical self. And so that's what we do at Girls, Inc. You know, the staff and mentors experience this with the girls, um, which validates the importance of the work that we do because we deconstruct, you know, whatever negative messages that they're getting. And then we help them reconstruct the message to make it positive. And in the same aspect, then we help the girls um, reconstruct their vision of themselves and help them feel confident in who they are. Right. Um, you know, I think about the messages that we got um, in our generation. You know, we were just, Garcelle, you, and you can jump in here, we were just comparing ourselves to the girls in our class. Right. Now, right. Yeah. You know, you've got the whole world to compare yourself mm -hmm. to. And it, it's so, I think today the conversation is more important than ever to reject the idea that you've got to look like that, whatever that is, mm -hmm. to be worthwhile. Right. And to, you know, and, and to, to feel like you have value. Right. And I, I think personally, even as a, a grown-up, a mother of three, I feel like we still feel the pressure. So imagine these young girls who are impressionable, who are, like you said, Sean, have access to things all over the world. It's not just your community or your kids in your school. It's all over the world. I mean, look at the Met Ball. Madonna shows up and she's completely naked. And it's like, that's <laughs> pressure seeing somebody at that age to be, to even feel like she still needs to do that. And I'm not ragging on Madonna or anything like that. But I just feel like the pressure is everywhere. So what can we do as a, a village of women to help these young girls not feel the pressure? And I think we're starting here today by having this conversation. But, you know, how do we make them uh, feel that it's okay to be who you are, who they are? Do you know? Right. Right. Um, do any of you want to, do, Becky or, uh, yeah. Becky or Stephanie, do you want to jump in there? Well, I was just going to jump in that I think, you know, totally um, empathize and think about a lot of these things on this end as well. And one of the things that we think a lot about at Facebook is this concept of allyship, that it's really not just women that need to change this, it's actually women and men. And how do we enroll and enlist everyone in our cause so that more people are able to feel confident and we are encouraging diversity of all types. And um, I think that that is actually like a really critical action step that we all need to own in terms of um, it's not just all of us on this call, it's, it's everyone and it's making sure that we're educating the men in our lives and our world about how they can make an impact too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that is, um, is tough um, is the fact that, um, wait a minute, I kind of lost your picture here, hopefully, uh, you got. Can you all still see me? Yes. Okay. Good. Good. Um, I think one of the, the the tough things for for young women, um, older women, all all of us, is that we often see or think we see limited opportunities because of our 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 color, our size, our gender, etc. And so, Garcelle, I want you to talk about that. Have you, you know, has it ever been discouraging? Did you ever feel that you've lost out on certain opportunities because you are an actress of color? And how did you handle that? You know, did, is it, was it something that affected you psychologically at first and then you just kind of learned how to deal with it? Sure. I mean, I think for me, uh, growing up, I didn't think there isn't anything that I couldn't do. So once I got into the industry, you know, I started off as a model. And then once I became an actress, you know, there were roles that they wouldn't see me for because of uh, color. I remember uh, I had heard about this show that was gonna, Aaron Spelling was doing back in the day called Models, Inc. And I was like, oh, my God, I want to try out for that. And then a couple of weeks went by, and I didn't hear anything. And I said, whatever happened to that show? And they said, well, they're not seeing anyone of color. And I thought, okay, it's based in New York. It's about models. Why wouldn't there be a, a 
you know, uh, a black model represented. And so that was really weird to me. And so we've come a long way, yes. Do we still have it? Do I? Did I handle it graciously? Probably not, not all the time. But I think we just have to try to overcome those things and not take it personally, but keep striving, not just for us, but for the people behind us. Right. I think that's what we're doing. Let, let, me, let me tell you what happened to me one time. Um, I was wearing, for the Oscars, I had this, I forgot what year it was. I had a beautiful... I think it was a green, that year maybe it was a beautiful green dress. And the publicist who I was working for had reached out to, after the Oscars, had reached out to some magazines and to say, oh, you know, uh, the these fashion magazines, oh, do you want to, you know, put a picture of Sean and her dress for the Oscars? And I won't, I won't mention the magazine. But they said to her, the woman from the magazine said to the publicist, my publicist, um, she goes, oh my gosh, we just love Sean. Yeah, we, we're putting a layout of all the Oscar gals. We love Sean, but we already have Kerry Washington. And but and she caught herself. My publicist said, oh well, what is what what does that have to you know what does that have to do with Sean? And the publicist caught her, and the woman from the magazine caught herself, and she says. Oh well, um, I meant that you know, and we didn't even have the same color gown on. We did, but it was interesting that she said that. And what it implied was, because I'm not an actress, Carrie Washington's not a talk show host, so it wasn't like they had too many actresses or too many shows. It the, the implication was we have a one slot for a woman of color, and that's it. So I. I, I remember that, and I remember thinking, "Gosh, that's sad. That's sad." Hope you know. Think about all the people, all the wonderful women out there who are not getting an opportunity because you think that there's only one slot for them. And I guess the point that I'm making is that you can internalize that, or you can say, "You know what? I'm just going to keep on pushing, and I'm going to take advantage of the whatever, whatever other opportunities come my way." Does anyone want to want to <laughs> remark on that? Well, you know, it's it's interesting because I um you can't tell I'm sitting down, but I'm over six feet tall, and uh -huh. <laughs> growing up, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Let's keep going. Um, uh -huh. growing, <laughs> no, but growing up, you know, when I was when I was in high school and middle school, I was the tallest person in the class, taller than all the girls and taller than all the boys, and even now, mostly taller than everybody. And I had to buy clothing that were those for boys, pants that were for boys. They didn't make them like, you know, now. This was a, a while ago. Um, and, you know, I felt very uncomfortable. And people would always be like, oh, you're the tall girl. That was how I was represented. And that's how I was like, you know, I had that like label. I'm the tall girl. There's always one of the, there's always a, the tall girl in the class. Um, and, you know, it took me a long time to be okay with that. And, you know, to be honest with you, sometimes I'm still not. Um, I try to see the positives in it. You know, I uh, can reach anything always. Um, people ask me for help in grocery stores. But I think to your point is that um, it's about just trying to see, you know, ignoring the negatives. Sometimes people aren't trying to be negative when they call something out like that. Um, and you know, it's up to, it's up to me in that situation to not take it. Not everything is meant to be a negative or a dig. And sometimes you just have to brush it off and say, you know what, maybe that person is just surprised or is just, you know, a little caught off guard or whatever it is. Um, but I think it's really starts with ourselves and being confident in who we are. And that takes time. It's still, like I said, I'm still working on it. It's still a challenge for me. And, you know, I'm not in high school anymore. <laughs> um, but um, it is something that, um, yeah, it just, it's, it, it takes time. And I think, again, sometimes you just have to kind of ignore stuff. You just have to kind of put those earmuffs on and have a little bit, um, have a little bit of inner strength, which, which is hard to do sometimes. Yes. Okay. Let's talk about the misconceptions that people have made about women in your industry. And I'm going to direct that to both uh, Maggie and Stephanie. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, sure. I mean, I think at least in the beauty industry, 
people may think you are shallow. Um, they think that you really might only want to be there because it's about makeup and maybe that you're super, super girly. Um, you know, we benefit itself is a huge company. So we always get surprise looks when we, yeah, there are lawyers who work here. There are chemists who work here. There are, you know, biz, like we have a huge finance team. Some people, People have literally know nothing about makeup that work here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, and, you know, I think there are, in terms of the beauty industry and cosmetics in particular, um, I think that there's just a level of maybe, um, like, there's a little bit of a, a conversation that happens. Oh, you must be sort of, like I mentioned, sort of into this girly kind of makeup-y playing, you know, you doesn't, they don't maybe go so deep into who you are and, and what your skill set is, um, potentially in, in maybe other industries. Okay. Sure. And I'll, I'm happy to build on that. I think, you know, working in the tech industry, there is a major perception that it's everyone in hoodies and it's all male <laughs> and there's no women. And um, I think in this, the same way Maggie gave the examples about um, all of the different groups that benefit. The same thing is true at Facebook. We have lawyers. We have people in finance. Um, you know, I am not an engineer. I don't have an engineering background, but I love people and I love connection and I work in sales. Um, and so I think it's really important that you can kind of connect to what you're passionate about and, and not be limited or constrained by what your perception might be. Um, I also, I mean, I'm very fortunate that work that I work for a very strong leader who advocates for um, Cheryl Sandberg, who just advocates for everyone to take risks, male or female, and everyone to speak up and everyone to have a seat at the table. And I think a lot of that stuff culturally helps both internally and externally, like our partnership, for example, with you guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think that the, that the portrayal or the perception of women in the industry is actually improving, or do you think it's kind of you know, kind of at a standstill? Do you think that, you know, it's not moving along as fast as it should? Sure. I mean, I can I can speak to the tech side specifically. Um, I think it's really easy to get bogged down in some of the negative statistics. Um, but when I take a step back and I think about the workforce that my mother entered 40 years ago and the workforce that my daughter will enter in 20 years, I actually think we've made a tremendous amount of progress and will continue. Um, and even just thinking about the concept of allyship and enlisting so many men and truly everyone in our cause and I think the expanding definition of diversity and what that looks like and so many major milestones we've made in the past chunk of time is actually to me really optimistic as we look ahead. Okay. And I agree. I can jump in there too, Sean, because you know with the work that we're doing with our Girls Inc. Girls, um, that's one of the things that we're trying to change too, you know, is change the look of the workforce and give our girls more opportunities for STEM careers. And, you know, I, I work with the girls every day and I've worked with the girls, you know, for 16 years, but my background is in technology. And so, you know, when the girls ask questions about what does it look like in the tech field or those stereotypes that Maggie was talking about, about hoodies and tennis shoes and jeans and stuff like that, you know, um, that's, you know, that's, that's changing, and, you know, we want to let the girls know that there's opportunities for them, you know, and we're teaching them about those uh, opportunities that are available and how diverse they are in every aspect. So even if you have the cosmetics company, you still have financial people and um, graphic designers and engineers and all of those other um, opportunities for the, you know, for uh, careers. So that's one of the things that we are trying to change, too. With tons of STEM programming that we do, I see... Um, our workforce changing and more girls in STEM careers as we uh, progress. Great. Okay, ladies, and as we wrap this up, um, I want to ask you this question about what you would tell your younger self um, about, you know, pursuing your dreams and not having limitations, not having self-limitations, uh, not being limited by, you know, the the, the obstacles or the challenges that you find uh, in the world every day. So, uh, Stephanie, I'm going to start with you. What would you tell your younger self? Sure. Um, you know, I think Garcelle said earlier in the, the conversation today, work with what you've got, be you. And Maggie talked about aspirational is not always achievable. If I could go back and talk to my 12 or 13-year-old self, I would just really encourage to be me and to be me from the beginning and own that with confidence. 
Um, and I think it took me till my early 30s to really feel that and own that. And um, I'm thankful that I can bring my whole self and whole life to my job. But I wish I had just started from that confidence and that foundation. And that's a gift I would love to give to any um, woman that was 12 or 13 or, or 8 or younger. Okay. Maggie? I think okay. I would say um, well, that. Sorry, she said oh. Maggie. No, Becky. No. <laughs> go ahead. Sorry, no, go ahead, Becky. Oh, well, I would tell my younger self, um, you know, I'm from a Hispanic family. So stereotypical Hispanic family. I mean, you're supposed to grow up and you get married and you have kids and then, you know, that's what a Hispanic woman is supposed to do. Um, and so, you know, I grew up with them, some of those stereotypical thoughts in my head. So I would tell myself, you know, you can do anything. You don't have to follow the circle that your, you know, so-called path is already laid out for you. You know, you can do anything. You can change the status quo, um, dream big, and then just, you know, follow those dreams that are truly in your heart and do what you're supposed to do, not what other people think that you're supposed to do. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Uh, and was that Maggie? Maggie? Yeah, Maggie? sure. Yeah. I think I think that um, it would also, for me at least, it would be important to know, and I'd like to be able to tell myself that it's okay to make mistakes too. And that you don't quite, you know, when you're, when I was young, when I was in my teens, I didn't know what, I didn't really know what my passions were yet. Um, and, you know, you mentioned that it, you know, not into your early, early 30s, I'm in my mid 30s and I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm just now starting to really understand what drives me and what is, what are the passions that I'm truly, you know, behind. And it takes a long time and it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to change your mind. It's okay. You know, you just have to keep going and keep thinking internally and saying, what do I really like? What don't I like? Who are the people that support me? And who are the people that don't support me? And really kind of, it's like, it's hard when you're young, but a little bit of a self-evaluation I think is important as much as you can. Um, for me that I, I think I, I would have, I would have benefited from that a little <laughs> bit more. <laughs> okay, and Garcelle. Okay, I would tell I would have told myself two things. One, that I am enough. And I think that's something we all need to sort of strive to have. It's like I am enough. I don't have to do everything everybody else is doing to feel uh that I am valid or that I am uh that I'm established or not established. And the other thing I would say is don't box me in. And that's huge for me. Don't box me in. Don't tell me what I'm supposed to be and what I'm not supposed to be and I'm supposed to have this job and not that job. Don't let anybody box you in. You figure out your life. It's your life. And I think that's what's important to, uh, to know and tell these young girls that this is your path. No matter what somebody else is doing, your path is yours. Hold on to that and make it the best you can. Wonderful. And I will, uh, let's see, I would tell my younger self, don't worry so much that everything is going to be okay, <laughs> that I have, you know, I have survived 100% of my challenging days so far. And there will be more challenging days, and I know that with focus and faith and perseverance and knowing that I have something unique to offer the world, that I am going to be able to achieve my goals, and I'm going to be able to shine and to dream big. That's what I would tell my younger self. How about that? <laughs> well, ladies, this has been so wonderful. I'm so happy to have been able to talk to you, and you all have just uh, just added so much. And I hope our uh, our audience of young ladies has gotten some of this uh, some of this valuable knowledge, and will go away feeling you know so much better and knowing that they have um, they have something unique to offer the world. So thank you very much. Thank you, ladies. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay.